An excerpt from A Free Man's Worship by Bertrand Russell. In the spectacle of death, in the endurance of intolerable pain, and in the irrevocableness of a vanished past, there is a sacredness, an overpowering awe, a feeling of the vastness, the depth, the inexhaustible mystery of existence, in which, as by some strange marriage of pain, the sufferer is bound to the world by bonds of sorrow. In these moments of insight, we lose all the eagerness of temporary desire, all struggling and striving for petty ends, all care for the little trivial things that, to a superficial view, make up the common life of day by day. We see surrounding the narrow shaft illumined by the flickering light of human comradeship, the dark ocean on whose rolling waves we toss for a brief hour. From the great night without, a chill blast breaks in upon our refuge. All the loneliness of humanity amid hostile forces is concentrated upon the individual soul, which must struggle alone with what of courage it can command against the whole weight of a universe that cares nothing for its hopes and fears. Victory in the struggle with the powers of darkness is the true baptism into the glorious companies of heroes. The true initiation into the overmastering beauty of human existence. From that awful encounter of the soul with the outer world, renunciation, wisdom, and charity are born, and with their birth, a new life begins. To take into the inmost shrine of the soul the irresistible forces whose puppets we seek to be, death and change, the irrevocableness of the past and the powerlessness of man before the blind hurry of the universe from vanity to vanity. To feel these things and to know them is to conquer them. This is the reason why the past is such magical power. The beauty of its motionless and silent pictures is like the enchanted purity of late autumn, when the leaves, though one breath would make them fall, still glow against the sky in golden glory. The past does not change or strive. Like Duncan, after life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. What was eager and grasping, what was petty and transitory, has faded away. The things that were beautiful and eternal shine out of it like stars in the night. Its beauty, to a soul not worthy of it, is unendurable, but to a soul which has conquered fate, it is the key of religion. The life of man, viewed outwardly, is but a small thing in comparison with the forces of nature. The slave is doomed to worship time and fate and death because they are greater than anything he finds in himself and because all his thoughts are things which they devour. But, great as they are, to think of them greatly, to feel their passionless splendor, is greater still. And such thought makes us free men. We no longer bow before the inevitable in oriental subjection, but we absorb it and make it a part of ourselves. To abandon the struggle for private happiness, to expel all the eagerness of temporary desire, to burn with passion for eternal things, this is emancipation, and this is the free man's worship. And this liberation is effected by contemplation of fate. For fate itself is subdued by the mind which leaves nothing to be purged by the purifying fire of time. United with his fellow men by the strongest of all ties, the tie of common doom, the free man finds that a new vision is with him always, shedding over every daily task the light of love. The life of man is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by weariness and pain toward a goal that few can hope to reach, and where none may tarry long. One by one, as they march, our comrades vanish from our sight, seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death. Very brief is the time in which we can help them, in which their happiness or misery is decided. Be it ours to shed sunshine on their path, to lighten their sorrows by the balm of sympathy, to give them the pure joy of a never tiring affection, to strengthen failing courage, to instill faith in hours of despair. Let us not weigh in grudging scales their merits and demerits, but let us think only of their need, of the sorrows, the difficulties, perhaps the blindness that make the misery of their lives. Let us remember that they are fellow sufferers in the same darkness, actors in the same tragedy with ourselves. And so when the day is over, when their good and their evil have become eternal by the immortality of the past, be it ours to feel that where they suffered, where they failed, no deed of ours was the cause. 
but whenever a spark of the divine fire kindled in their hearts, we were ready with encouragement, with sympathy, with brave words in which high courage glowed. Brief and powerless is man's life. On him and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls pitiless and dark. Blind to good and evil, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way. For man, condemned today to lose his dearest, tomorrow himself to pass through the gate of darkness, it remains only to cherish, ere yet the blow fall, the lofty thoughts that ennoble his little day. Disdaining the coward talents of the slave of fate, to worship at the shrine that his own hands have built, undismayed by the empire of chance, to preserve a mind free from the wanton tyranny that rules his outward life, proudly defiant of the irresistible forces that tolerate, for a moment, his knowledge and his condemnation, to sustain alone a weary but unyielding atlas, the world that his own ideals have fashioned despite the trampling march of unconscious power. So, A Free Man's Worship is one of the first essays that I've read from Mr. Bertrand Russell, who is of course a very eminent logician and philosopher of the 20th century. And uh, he's, well, well known for many things. And notably, he is also well known as a member of something of the respectable old guard of atheism, both by the atheist community as well as by Christians. So, when I first read this essay, it really struck a chord with me. It felt like this, like Russell understood the way that the world appeared to me. Some people have said that this essay is an outline of the quintessential atheistic thought. But for me, it can only be a religious essay. But of course, we're talking past each other because, you know, we just have different understandings of what religion means. So, it is a very stirring essay. And it makes me kind of sad, actually, that I was not able to resonate as strongly with almost any of his other words. But this essay, you know, there's something about it. It's like there's a fire in it when he writes. One of my favorite essays of all time.